you know, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Paulina Dominic um, to talk to us about the Polish community uh, in Ottoman Istanbul. Um, Paulina um, recently successfully defended her PhD um, at the Graduate School of Global Intellectual History, um, which is run by the Friar and the Humboldt Universities in Berlin. Um, and her PhD dissertation, dissertation was a biography of Seyfedin Thade Gastoit. I probably got the pronunciation wrong, but he was a French-Polish activist um, working against Central European imperial interests, trying to draw together sort of the North African sort of Muslim connection with Polish um, uh, groups. Um, Paulina, before uh, studying for a PhD, Paulina was at the University of Oxford, uh, where she read Turkish and Persian um, and gained a master's in Oriental Studies. Um, she has been based at the Orient Institute in Istanbul um, and uh, has been contributing to uh, a project called Istanbul Memories, Personal Narratives of Late of the later Ottoman period. Her particular areas of interest um, center around global history, um, trans-regional connections between the Middle East and East Central Europe, Polish political immigration in Europe and the Middle East, um, pan-Islamism, anti-imperialisms in, in the Muslim world. So a whole mix of things that cut across the, the region between East and Central Europe. Without further ado, I'm now going to welcome Paulina. I'm going to stop sharing and invite her to share her screen. Thank you very much for this really, really kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, to, give, uh, to give this talk. It's uh, really a great pleasure. I will start sharing my screen. Um, and I, I apologize for my, vo uh, for my voice. Um, I've been trying to stay healthy as long as possible, but unfortunately I'm not sure something, I'm getting a cold. So I'm sorry if I cough sometimes. Uh, <laughs> my, my apologies. All right. So uh, once again, thank you very much for being here. Mm, and let's start. Um, in his 1862 memoir entitled The Strange Lives of Polish Men and Women, the chief representative of the Polish political emigration in Istanbul, uh, Michał Tchaikovsky, known after his conversion to Islam as Mehmed Sadik Pasha, compared the Levantine community of the Ottoman capital to his own compatriots from the Mazuria and the Lesser Poland regions um, and described them as follows. Men and women of Pera, the nation of polyglots, are chirping away like our Mazurians and Krakowians. And at the end of each sentence, they repeat, give me your money, end of quote. In turn, three decades earlier, in the 1830s, a prominent Polish orientalist and traveler, Ignacy Pietraszewski, summarized his observations concerning Istanbul's Levantine milieu in the, follow in the following way. These women of Pera, they are like devils, in their short kaftans, scarves on their hips, and with their colorful lips. They do not want to listen to you, but keep on blinking their eyes. He continued, and similarly to Tchaikovsky, drew attention to their linguistic abilities. I quote, with their squeaky voices, they blabber interchangeably in Greek, Turkish, Italian, and French. End of quote. So in this presentation, I would like to focus on the relations between the Levantine community and the Polish newcomers into the Ottoman Empire, in the, in the late Ottoman capital. Uh, I will try to elucidate the reasons for mutual proximity and explore the uh, urban spaces shared by both communities. Uh, I would like to delve into the issue of intermarriages, as well as the phenom phenomenon of Levantanization of the descendants of the Polish emigrants in Istanbul. Uh, by focusing on several case studies, 
I shall shed light on various dimensions of interactions between the Levantine community of Istanbul and the 19th century Polish political emigres. But before I focus specifically on the Polish Levantine relations, let me give you a brief overview of the presence of the Polish political emigration in the late uh, Ottoman Empire in general and in Istanbul uh, in particular. Um, so throughout the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was one of the key destinations for uh, the Polish political emigres after Paris and, um, and London, following the final partition of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1795, and most notably after the 1830-31 November uprising, the armed rebellion against Russia that caused the mass emigration of the political elites from the lands of the partitioned Poland-Lithuania. The state of the Poles fled to Istanbul in the hope of securing Ottoman support in their efforts to regain national independence. The, foundation, <laughs> sorry, the foundations for Polish-Ottoman cooperation were set in Paris and London in the 1830s by representatives of the leading political faction in exile called Hotel Lombard and the Ottoman diplomats. In light of the welcoming attitude of Ottoman statesmen towards Polish emigres, and Istanbul's favorable location as a base to fight against Russia. For the four decades, from the 1840s uh, up until the 1870s, Istanbul turned into a key center of the Polish political emigration. Uh, Polish, um, Polish Ottoman relations in that period were characterized by a far reaching political cooperation, and the number of Polish emigres within Ottoman borders tended to increase during periods of armed conflicts against Russia, whether fought by the Poles or the Ottomans. Accordingly, the major waves of Polish immigration into the Ottoman Empire occurred during the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, the 1853-56 Crimean War, the 1863-64 January Uprising, and finally during the 1877-78 Russo-Ottoman War, the Doxan Harbi. Uh, the importance that the Ottoman Empire held for the Polish national activities of the 19th century can be illustrated by three key enterprises. So the first one was the Agency of the Polish Eastern Mission. The agency was founded in Istanbul in 1841 and had a network of branches across the Balkans. The leading organizer of the Polish political life in the Ottoman Empire, the mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, Michał Tchaikovsky, Mehmet Sadik Pasha, after, uh, was appointed as the first head of the agency. The Balkans held an important place in the political projects of the Polish emigration and became the key, the key sphere of uh, Polish Ottoman cooperation as they were uh, the chief region where Russia sought to expand its sphere of influence by promoting a pro-Russian pan-Slavism. Um, the Polish program in the Balkans aimed at the strengthening of the, Ottoman, of the Ottoman government in the region. By focusing on the Slavs, Poles planned to develop an independent center for a Balkan Slavic state, preferably within the Ottoman structure, and to encourage the growth of a strong anti-Russian orientation within this area. In practice, the agency's aim was to incite revolts against the Russians in the territories neighboring to the Ottoman Empire, to alleviate the core the co majority non Muslim provinces of the empire, and to weaken the Russian influence at the, at the Sublime Port. Uh, another enterprise, or one of the most important, um, uh, most important let's say, symbols of the Polish presence in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century is uh, the place that probably many of you, of which many of you know, uh, <coughs> the, uh, today Polonescu, but earlier Adampol, a Polish settlement um, that, was, that was founded in 1842. Uh, it was a place for subsequent waves of political emigres to settle. It consisted of the, of the former slaves um, that were captured by Circassians. Uh, and uh, and the fact that they were being sold on the markets across the Ottoman Empire prompted the Polish immigration already present in the in uh, within the Ottoman borders to set up the the, co the colonial as they used to call it um, to fund the settlement by <coughs> by signing a by signing a contract with the with the French priests uh, and uh, and 
and and resettling the the poles that they were able to that, that were being sold on the um, by by circassians so um for decades it was uh, it was a place for for the subsequent waves of political emigrants to settle uh polonescu adam pol also served as a cover for political activities and constituted a reserve of soldiers for for a potential war against russia um as we know it exists until today under the name of Polonescu and is located at the at the Baikos district of, of Istanbul and is regarded as one of the most important symbols of uh, Polish Turkish friendship up until up until today. Um, and uh, the third enterprise that I think is worth mentioning in this context when it comes to the 19th century Polish uh, Polish presence in the in the Ottoman Empire are is the is the legion uh, called the Sultanic Cossacks. So the Ottoman Empire uh, became a center for the formation of the Polish legions, which together with the Ottoman army were supposed to free Poland from the, from the Russian yoke, from the Russian occupation. Uh, there were many, many uh, attempts to create Polish legions beginning in the late 18th century, but uh, the most emblematic among them uh, was the Sultanic Cossacks legion which was a cavalry regiment, uh, regiment organized by the by the mentioned Mehmed Sadik Pasha, Michał Tchaikovsky, during the Crimean War. Uh, it consisted of Slavs who were commanded by Polish officers, and which and it functioned until the 1877-70 Russo-Ottoman Ottoman War. Um, what is also important, and uh, on the on on the slide you can see. Uh, the uniforms that were worn by the soldiers uh, of this uh, of this legion of this regiment, uh, as well as on the top you can see that the banner, which uh, is quite characteristic, and depicts a Polish eagle, Polish white eagle, and uh, and a crescent next next to it. Um, what I think is quite important to remark when it comes to the Polish presence in the in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century is the fact that the <coughs> sorry the presence of Polish of Polish immigration was not limited to the activities aimed at the restoration of an independent Polish state. Rather, Polish emigres were also involved in various enterprises connected to the 19th century reforms of the Ottoman state. Um, so they were quite active when it comes to the, to the reforms of the Tanzimat era, uh, while several Polish emigres found themselves within the direct entourage of uh, Sultan Abdulaziz. Uh, one of them that you may have heard about or at least have seen his paintings was Stanisław Chlebowski, who at the time was a court, for some time was a, the court painter of the, of the Sultan, of Sultan Abdulaziz. Uh, but other than that, Władysław Kościelski, who was, the, was uh, responsible for introduction of the European etiquette to the Ottoman court or, um, Tadeusz Okszorzechowski and Władysław Przybyski were involved in the in the in the organization of the of Abdulaziz uh, of the trip to Europe uh, taken by by Abdulaziz uh, in the 1860s, as well as even some people, some Polish emigrants, accompanied uh, uh, kept in company during during the trip. Uh, so while several emigrants found themselves within the within the direct circle of, of, of the Sultan, of Sultan Abdulaziz. The chief figures of Tanzimat, such as Mustafa Reshid Pasha, Ali Pasha, and uh, Fuad Pasha, welcomed the Polish emigrants' services in various spheres. And, and as such, many of, uh, of them pursued occupations in the Ottoman army, administration, diplomacy, intelligence, press, road and telegraph construction, health services, as well as industry and agriculture. Um, just to give you an example, uh, Polish engineers were employed in various projects which aimed at development of the infrastructure throughout the Ottoman Empire, from the Balkan provinces in the west to, to Baghdad in the east. And, uh, and what we know is that during his tenure as a, uh, as a governor of the Danubian province, Mitad Pasha eagerly employed Polish refugees as civil and military engineers, telegraph employees, teachers and cartographers. And we know of several examples that when he was appointed as a governor um, of Baghdad, uh, then he took some of uh, his favorite Polish employees along with him. Um, yes, and uh, just so as to be able to demonstrate 
the existence of the Ottoman Empire for the Polish geopolitical plans um, in the 19th century, I think it is worthy bringing up the writings of a prominent emigre activist in Paris, Krystyna Ostrowski, who had been an avid um, and ardent advocate of the Polish Ottoman cooperation from the 1830s onwards. Um, in his letter to Mustafa Reshid Pasha, shortly before the outbreak of the, of the Crimean War, he emphasized the importance of the Polish Ottoman cooperation and insisted on the need for an Ottoman Slavic political alliance once Poland regained independence, would regain independence with Poland in the role of the of the leader of the Slavs and the Ottoman Empire, uh, yeah, uh, joined by the Ottoman Empire. Um, Ostrovsky regarded such, a, um, such an alliance as, as essential to maintain security in Europe and to curtail Russia's expansionism. Um, and now coming back or like going closer to our topic, uh, well, the, when it comes to the Polish presence within, uh, within the Ottoman capital, the Polish pre presence in Istanbul, the main destination in the Polish emigres in Istanbul were, as one can imagine, the cosmopolitan para and surrounding quarters, which were inhabited mainly by the non-Muslim population. Um, on this slide, you can see my humble attempt, together with two colleagues, uh, Katarzyna Papiesz and Michał Połczyński, a few years ago, when we tried actually to map uh, the, the Polish Istanbul while using ma maps of different of different uh, quarters of the of the city. So here is our attempt at marking the most important places related to Polish uh, to Polish activities within today's uh, today's Bayolo. So um, just to like tell how we, um, how numerous the, the Polish presence was in 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 uh, in, in Pera, um, <laughs> it's worth recalling the the Crimean War. And, and the prospect of organization of a Polish legion by the Ottoman, uh, within the Ottoman army, when, uh, which obviously acted as an incentive for a number of emigres to arrive on the Bosphorus. And, um, and as such, impressions of what I like calling the, the Polish Istanbul figure prominently in the, in the, in the memoirs of those, uh, of those emigres who arrived during the Crimean War. So one of them uh, commented on the atmosphere in Pera during the Crimean War as follows. I quote, There are more Poles than Turks here. They are everywhere and continuously talk about politics. This is even worse. End of quote. So uh, what, what we know is that uh, during this, this one or two decades, the Polish shops and ateliers were scattered all around Pera and Galata. Uh, various accounts claim that in the aftermath of the Crimean War, Poles were the most numerously represented group of Europeans in Istanbul after the French and Italians, and, uh, and that Polish could be heard at every step in Pera. Mm, in his article on the Polish Times of Pera, the German Orientalist Friedrich mentions the presence of as many as 7,000 Poles in Istanbul in the 1850s. Although these numbers might be exaggerated, and no other, no other scholar confirms them, uh, they still suggest that Polish emigrants were numerous, numerously represented in Istanbul. Um, during the 1850s, 60s, up until the 70s, a few Polish centers arose where Poles gathered, uh, smoked water pipe, uh, read newspapers, and discussed current affairs. Uh, their favorite venues were cafes and shops run by fellow uh, Polish countrymen. Uh, one of the chief meeting points of the Polish emigres was the Bulbul Cafe, which you could you should be able to see on the on the map. Um, so uh, it was located on the on the on the on Istiklal on uh, on today's Istiklal on uh, on Grand Rue de Pera, and uh, it was a place where, for instance, ethnographer and historian. Uh, Franciszek Duchinski propagated his controversial theories on the non-Slavic provenance of Russians. Uh, there also existed a Polish club run by, uh, by a writer and, um, and a prominent politician, Zygmunt Miłkowski, where lectures on Polish literature were given and Polish poetry um, was read. Mm, also, some family houses uh, in Istanbul became important immigration centers. So one of them was the house of uh, Michał uh, Tchaikovsky, Mehmet 
Mehmet, I'm sorry, whoops. Yeah. Mehmet Sadik Pasha, uh, whom I have uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and of his life partner, Ludwika Śniadecka. Uh, it was located in the proximity of the, of the Jihangir, uh, Jihangir Mosque, and um, emigrants recounted that one had to ask for the Polish embassy uh, in order to be able to find it. Uh, and rem remarkably, most of the issues concerning the future of, um, of emigration or like the, its activities were decided at, at Tchaikovsky's place before being subsequently officially addressed at the, at the Sublime Port. Um, one of the places in today's Bayolo, which for decades evoked the Polish presence in the Ottoman Empire, is a side street that I, you can see here on the, on the map, one of the side streets of, the, of Istiklal. Uh, <coughs> which uh, which leads to the pier in uh, in Topane, uh, and that's where the building of a of the last Polish representation to the Sublime Port before the partitions in the late 18th century was located. Um, to com commemorate this place, um, the street which today bears the name of Nurizia Sokal, uh, was called Lech Sokal, Rue de Pologne, or po Polish Street, throughout the 19th century until the 1950s. Uh, given the symbolic meaning of this street uh, for Istanbul's Polish community, Poles were very keen at, uh, to settle down in its vicinity and thus uh, the, the, the surroundings bore the unofficial name of Lech Mahalesi, uh, Lech Mahalesi the, the Polish neighborhood. Mm. Another important site indicative of the Polish presence in the late Ottoman Istanbul is the house of the Polish, uh, of the Polish poet that you can see on this map, uh, yeah, here. Um, here is the house of, uh, of the leading, uh, or is, is the house of the chief Polish uh, romantic poet and the leading activist in exile, Adam Mickiewicz. Uh, and it's located in, in today's Talabasha. Uh, Mickiewicz arrived in Istanbul in the summer of 1855 to end the disagreements between the among the emigres who were attempting to organize the Polish legions during the war. Uh, nevertheless, he died a few months after, after he arrived in the Ottoman capital and the modest building where he spent the last days of his life since 1955 has been functioning as the a, as a, as a, as a museum of the, of the late poet. When it comes to today's Shishli, along with the neighboring uh, Peran Galata, it was a leading Polish emigres in the mid 19th uh, century Istanbul. Uh, so after the end of the Crimean War, uh, many of the Polish volunteers who joined the conflict on the Ottoman side stayed within the Ottoman borders. Uh, in in Tatavla and uh, Yenisha here, today's Kurtulush, they built wooden houses with money they had received from the British government. Um, because uh, since they joined joined the, the one of the legions that was organized by the Brits, which also also called the Second Sultanic Cossacks Legion, um, and uh, thanks to the European character of Shishli, the emigres found it easier to get used to the new conditions for sure. Uh, Polish community also contributed to foundation of the Georgian Ch Catholic Church of uh, Notre, Notre Dame of uh, of Lourdes. Uh, Istanbul Post financed and carved in wood the altar of the Black Madonna of Częstochowa which is one of the most important Polish sanctuar sanctuaries nowadays. Uh, moreover, organizations focused on mutual support of the community, such as home poor and nursing home were located uh, in this area, in uh, Pangalce and Tarikoy. Uh, Polish community also funded the Society of Mutual Help and Solidarity, which was active from 1885 up until, up until World War I. Mm, finally, it is also worth mentioning that uh, Bebek, which was one of the favorite locations of the Polish emigres on the Bosphorus, is frequently referred to in the memoirs of the Polish emigres as a, as a small Polish colony, given how attractive uh, it was for Poles to settle down there, especially those who were more, uh, those who were better off. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, although Poles in the Ottoman Empire tended to stay close to, to their fellow countrymen, it does, it does not mean that they were isolated from non-Muslim communities of Istanbul. So uh, fellow Slav minorities, especially Bulgarians, uh, figure most prominently in the Polish memoirs. Emigres state openly that they felt greatest affinity with them. 
Uh, as I have already mentioned, the main political aim of the chief Polish organization, the Polish Agency of uh, the Eastern Mission, um, was to was to impede Russian influence both among Slavs in the Balkans and among Ottoman statesmen in the Sublime Port. And one of those the most most outstanding manifest manifestations of what one one may call referred to as the Slav solidarity took place in 1855 uh, during the transportation of Adam Mickiewicz's coffin to a France-bound ship. Memoirs describe hundreds of representatives of all the Balkan Slavs who accompanied Poland's chief romantic poet from his last address in Talabasha to the Galata Pier. Uh, Polish emigres also point in the memoirs that they tended to stay close with other emigre communities. Um, for instance, Zygmunt Miłkowski mentions his frequent contacts with Hungarians, Italians, and Romanians, with whom the first significant wave of Polish emigres arrived in the Ottoman Empire following the failure of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848. Mm, Poles and Hungarians were often treated as one group by the Ottomans, and at some occasions they were called collectively as, uh, as Magyar, as, as Hungarians, without making any distinction between Poles and, and Hungarians and also can see in some of the documents in the Ottoman archives. And when it comes to the, to the Levantines, uh, where they were presumably the group within the multicultural cityscape of the late Ottoman capital with whom Poles felt most familiar. Uh, this was mainly thanks to the shared Roman Catholic faith. Uh, Polish emigres coined the word for Istanbul's French-speaking inhabitants, Perota and Perotka. Uh, which meant nothing other than the resident of Pera in both um, uh, in masculine and feminine form. Uh, one can find numerous records of baptisms, marriages, uh, and deaths of individuals bearing Polish surnames or identified as of Polish nationality in the parishes of, um, of the Saint-Esprit uh, Saint Cathedral in Istanbul. Uh, churches such as uh, Santa Maria de Draperie and uh, San Antoine were natural meeting points for both communities. Mm. And certainly the most visible memento of the Polish presence in Istanbul is the Ferrico Latin Catholic Cemetery, which uh, was the most important burial place for the emigres. Uh, Polish surnames uh, on approximately 700 graves remind us that the Ottoman Empire was the last destination for, for many of them. Mm. It was, um, it was a common practice for Polish emigres to marry Levantine women. Uh, we learn from the memoirs uh, of, uh, of, of Poles that Levantines not only learned Polish easily, but also immediately shared their husband's love for Poland and hatred for Russia. Uh, and there's also no doubt that the mixed marriages uh, contributed to the emigres' integration into the Ottoman society. And this practice also demonstrates that Polish emigres became part of and contributed to Istanbul's multicultural panorama. Uh, in this respect, uh, the most representative example is without any doubt uh, the descendant of a distinguished Polish noble family, uh, Count Leon Ostroluk. Mm, his figure and work uh, are remarkable as he was invited to the Ottoman Empire from Paris during the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, when in 1894, he was appointed the head of the legal department of the Ottoman Public Debt Administration. Uh, Ostroluk came to prominence as a as a legal advisor to the Ministry of Justice during the second constitutional period, and as an author of numerous legal reform projects. Uh, he played an important role in secularization and modernization of the Ottoman judiciary system during the Young Turk era. Mm, he, mm, as, an, as an international jurist versed in the, in the international law of European jurisdiction and in the public and religious laws of Muslim countries, Ostroluk put his signature to a number of works. Uh, he published uh, throughout his whole life on a number of subjects which were not limited to jurisprudence. Uh, he was internationally acclaimed as an authority in the field of Turkish law and history. And, uh, and Ostroluk was an, was an outspoken commentator of, uh, of the developments taking place within the Ottoman borders. Uh, his publications represent an influ influential voice of assessment of the reform efforts taking place 
in the last decades of the Ottoman Empire, as well as of the revolutionary changes that took place in the last decade, uh, that characterized the emergence of the Republic of Turkey. Uh, in 1895, Ostroruk married Jean-Marie Lorando, uh, a daughter of a notable Levantine family. And uh, through this marriage, she became part of Istanbul's Levantine upper class. Uh, quite remarkably, the Ostroruk family played an important role in the societe life of the early 20th century Istanbul. And uh, their, their villa in Kandilli, their yale, on the Asian shore of the Bosphorus was transformed into a chief meeting point of the Ottoman and French elites in the first two decades of the 20th century. Um, and uh, yes, and uh, apart from that, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, apart from being like, an active member of the Levantine community, Ostroduk also uh, was actively involved in the life of the local Polish community. Among others, he was an official representative of, uh, of the Czartoryski family, uh, who were the family, um, the, 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 the leaders of the mentioned Hotel Lambert, the most important political, um, political organization in exile. And, uh, and he acted as a representative of Hotel Lambert uh, in Folonescu and uh, also uh, worked as a, as a voluntary legal advisor to the Polish community of Istanbul. Uh, Ostrolu came to prom prominence as an ardent advocate of the Ottoman legal system reform, an expert of the Islamic jurisprudence, ambassador of the Ottoman French cultural rapprochement and a spokesman for the Polish community in Istanbul. Thanks to the multifaceted nature of his activities, one could thus identify his persona with the French political interests, Ottoman reformer spirit, Levantine media of the late Ottoman Istanbul, as well as Polish noble origin. What, what I think should be mentioned at this stage is, <coughs> is also the, the issue of, um, of what was called uh, Levantanizatia, Levantanization um, of the emigrants and their families, which was re regarded by some of them as a considerable threat to their distinctive Polish national identity. Uh, so this issue has been eagerly raised by the Polish travelers to Istanbul, who during their, uh, their travels would visit their Polish fellow countrymen and their descendants. Um, in this respect, it is worth recalling the case of, uh, of a gentleman named Fuad Bey Muzaffar Tchaikovsky, whom you can see on the, on the left, uh, while visiting one of the Polish travelers in the lands of uh, partition Poland, Lithuania, where they, where they were having Nagile. Um, so um, Fuad Bey Muzaffar Tchaikovsky was the grandson of Michał Tchaikovsky, about whom I have I have spoken quite 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 a bit during this presentation, and son of Władysław Tchaikovsky, Muzaffer Pasha, and uh, of a Levantine lady from the Kiriko family, whom we don't know by name. Uh, Władysław Tchaikovsky uh, grew up in Paris, and upon completing his education at the prestigious French military school of, uh, of Saint-Cyr, in the early 1860s, he was called up by his father by then a general in the Ottoman army, to join him in Istanbul. So, um, Muzaffer um, Władysław Tchaikovsky was appointed a captain of the Sultanic Cossacks Legion and next the commander of the Polish School of Officers. He also sought an independent career in the Ottoman army and state apparatus, and his education background in one of the most prestigious military schools in Europe must have been an asset in this respect. Um, Muzaffer served as an at the champ uh, to the Grand Vizier um, Mehmed Fuad Pasha and then to Sultan Abdul Aziz. His career reached its peak during the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. And having found himself in a close circle of the Sultan, he was appointed the commander of the Imperial Stable and was involved in the enterprise of re reorganization of the Ottoman army. Among others, he acted as the head of the commission responsible for organization of the Hamidiyya Corps. Uh, unlike his father, Muzaffar Pasha never converted to Islam. Uh, his story is revealing of how his adherence to Christianity facilitated the final step of his career, as from 1902 until his death in 1907, he held the post of the governor of the recently established Mount Lebanon um, of, the new, uh, yeah, of the newly established region uh, or Mutasarifate of Mount Lebanon. 
uh, Tchaikovsky became a close friend with a Polish traveler, whom you can see on the, on the picture on the left, uh, Henryk Cieciewski, who visited the Ottoman capital on several occasions in the last few years of the 19th century. It was actually during, one, uh, during the train ride from Izmir to Istanbul that uh, Cieciewski met the son of Władysław Tchaikovsky, uh, Fuad Bey Muzaffer, whose um, card, uh, business card you can see on the slide. Um, and it was Fuad Bey who introduced his father to, to Cieciewski. In his memoir, The Polish Traveller, devotes considerable space to the issue of allegiances and identification. While Cieciewski writes highly of Władysław Tchaikovsky, who, as he reported, I quote, was a well-respected man, a son of an emigre of the old style, had been attached to Poland with his entire soul, and whom he described as a Polish noble who represented the Poles in Turkey with dignity, he was not as fond of Tchaikovsky's son, Fuad Bey Muzaffer. Uh, he characterized Kim as follows, I quote, he was not attached to any country, an opportunistic Arabist. I asked him once if it, were, if it were difficult for him to leave the work in Turkey, where he was born and brought up. He responded, Je sais la Turquie tant que je la serre. That's to say, I serve Turkey as much as I serve it. As we further learn from the text, Cieczerski indirectly blamed Fuad Muzaffer's attitude on the cosmopolitan way of his upbringing and on his mother's significant influence on his actions. Given the situation and the ongoing process of Levantanization of the descendants of Polish emigres, after Poland regained independence in 1918, it became popular to send children to Warsaw and Krakow to study and become acquainted with Polish culture. The most illustrative example is family of, Mits of Adam Mickiewicz's cook, Antoni Webkowski, his son, Jan Webkowski, who worked in the Ottoman Bank and was known as, uh, I quote, the faithful guardian of Polish traditions on the Bosphorus, sent his son to study in Poland to, as he informed in his letters, prevent his total Levantanization. Um, and at this point, it is also necessary to remark that in total there existed three quite separate Polish communities next to each other in the Ottoman capital. So the first one was the one discussed before, the one that lived and worked in the quarters of Pera, Galata, Pangalte, Shishli, and was thus exposed to assimilation into the cityscape of the, of the multicultural late Ottoman capital. The other were inhabitants of Adampol, today's Polonesco, and one can argue that because of their relative distance from the city and the close character of the settlement uh, for decades, uh, it was a condition to be Catholic uh, and at least Slav. Uh, and similarly, like masses uh, were celebrated in Polish, in, the, in, in Polonesco. So consequently, it was easier for its inhabitants to preserve their Polish traditions and language until the establishment of the Republic of Turkey. Another group, even if less numerous, but still worth mentioning, were descendants of Polish converts to Islam. Uh, this group arrived in the Ottoman Empire mainly after the failure of 1848 uh, Hungarian Revolution, and as a result of what uh, of what to be known, what, what came to be known uh, in the Turkish historiography as the multijular meselesi, the the refugees issue. Uh, that caused a short-term international crisis between the Ottoman Empire on the one hand and the Russian and uh, Austrian empires on the other, as the latter insisted on the extradition of the Polish and Hungarian refugees, respectively, and the, uh, there was a time when the Sublime Port refused to comply with this demand. So in order to avoid the deportation of the Polish and Hungarian exiles, Ottoman officials offered them to convert to Islam and henceforth be considered Ottoman subjects. In return, potential, con potential converts were promised uh, personal security and, uh, and employment in the Ottoman, in the Ottoman army. Uh, eventually, this group was not very numerous as the proposal had caused a great discontent among the immigration leadership in Paris and the refugees themselves. Yet those who had resolved to convert and subsequently their descendants reached high ranks in the Ottoman administration. For instance, a uh, son of Konstantin Bozhensky, Mustafa Jalaluddin Pasha, whom you can see on the picture, Enver Pasha, uh, was, for instance, a prominent officer and diplomat who, following in his father's footsteps, 
reached high military and diplomatic ranks in Abdul Hamid II's administration. For instance, in light of the 1899-1901 Boxer Rebellion, in 1901, he led an Ottoman pan-Islamic expedition to the Muslims of China on behalf of the Sultan Caliph. Uh, the goal of this expedition was to dissuade the Chinese Muslim troops from supporting this anti-foreign and anti-Christian rebellion of the popular Boxer militia, and as a close associate of Abdul Hamid II, and very passionate from the Ottoman administrative life shortly after the 1908 Young Turk Revolution. And uh, in order to sort of wrap up, uh, just a few words. Um, so, well, Istanbul was for many, many days, for, for four, over four decades, one of the most important destinations for hundreds of Polish emigrants. Uh, while most of them arrived in the Ottoman Empire as a part of the struggle for Polish independence, many Poles played an important role in the changes taking place in the Ottoman Empire throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, the multi-ethnic and multi-confessional character of Istanbul, especially of Pera, facilitated assimilation of the emigrants into its multicultural mosaic. Um, thanks to this inclusiveness, they could identify with a considerable part of its inhabitants with whom they tended to share common religion and language. The memoirs and correspondences and above all activities revealed that the specific character of the late Ottoman capital was regarded as a great opportunity, but at the same time happened to be perceived as a danger to their distinctive identity. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for, for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing and um, do we have any immediate questions or comments for Paulina? Um, if not, can I, can I lead with something? Can you explain a little bit more about how were Polish emigres organized after the partition of the Commonwealth? Um, mm -hmm. it, because I know there was a Paris group and there's, there are all the emigres in, in Turkey. Were they coordinated? Were they separate? Was there a government in exile? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm explaining straight away. Uh, so basically, um, the first big wave of, of, of um, emigration from the lands of partition Poland, Lithuania, uh, which is also known in the Polish historiography as uh, the Great Emigration, it was not because of the numbers of people who left, but because of the importance of those people who left, because most of them were nobles. Uh, which uh, which led to the fact that most of the of the activities of uh, cultural and political activities in the 19th century uh, were did take place in Paris and not in the lands of partitioned Polish uh, Poland Lithuania. So yes, indeed, the most important destination initially was Paris, and that's where the of the emigrants were organized. Uh, that's where basically a sort of government in exile existed that was represented by the by the Hotel Lambert that I mentioned and its uh, its political leader Prince Adam Czartoryski was un unofficially known as the uncrowned king of Poland. Obviously Hotel Lambert was not the only political faction we also had different more so this was more monarchist whereas other uh, political organizations were more on to the left more democratic in a way uh, but yes so what mainly happened is that the basis for the Polish Ottoman cooperation were established in Paris. And then support that was given by the Ottoman diplomats, Poles decided to send its representatives from Paris or different places like London, because at the time London was also quite an important political center, political emigrant center, center for Poles, to send their representatives and start their activities in the Ottoman Empire. So yes, indeed, anything that was going on in the Ottoman Empire between the early 1840s up until 1870s was actually uh, was actually uh, governed uh, from or like um, it was in a way governed administered from Paris. So in the archives in Krakow or in Paris, we we can see that there was an ongoing correspondence, ongoing uh, letter exchanges between between Paris and, 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 and the Ottoman Empire. So basically those emigrants based in the Ottoman Empire represented the interest of, of the political center in exile in Paris, in France. Okay, 
Thank you. I mean, maybe a, a follow up question. And then after that, what happened? Was there were there differences of view? Was the Levantinization of the Ottoman Poles a, a, a factor in you know, a disconnect appearing between Paris and uh, Constantinople? So I think that the, uh, so we can see like even <coughs> in the correspondences when you know most of those which is also very interesting because most of these letter exchanges actually go uh, happen in French uh, even though because you know they usually are especially in the later years yeah so when we see the first generation they are in Polish so when we have like Adam Czartoryski Prince Adam Czartoryski corresponding with uh, Tchaikovsky who was the leader of the Polish immigration in 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 in, in the Ottoman Empire. This, this is that correspondence is in Polish, but the next generation, even though they talk about Polish issues, they're trying to organize, let's say, for instance, the Polish Legion in 1877 78, everything, ta everything takes place already in French. So we can see among those, like for instance, Bonkowski family, where we do witness a lot of uh, intermarriages, so where mothers are usually Levantines. Um, that there is a big attachment to Poland still, but Poland more as a symbol, yes. Yeah? So when it's when it's handy for these people to get in touch with the Polish community, I think the Bonkowski family is quite interesting. Um, one of the Bonkowski brothers was the chief chemist. Uh, Ernest Bonkowski was a diplomat. Um, and, and I found a letter written by Ernest in 1880s in which he's writing to one of the one of the um, representatives of the Czartoryski family in Paris, um, who at the time, the family already moved to the lands of partition Poland, Lithuania. And he's actually asking her uh, to support him uh, financially or to help him financially because he's trying to educate his son. But unfortunately, the financial situation of the Ottoman Empire is really bad. Uh, and you know, in order to be able to raise a good Polish boy, uh, it would be amazing if the if the princess could support him with some financial aid so that his son can finish the boarding school in uh, in, in in Istanbul and then be sent to the to the military academy in Vienna, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there are moments when actually the Polishness is used a little bit instrumentally, uh, but I think that the, the factor that we have the moment where the activities are no longer cooperated from Paris and somehow two communities go apart. It's more connected to general political atmosphere when it comes to the lands of partition Poland, Lithuania, when somehow the strategy of regaining independence changed from like the armed rebellions to work at the foundations. So basically after the 1863-64 uprising, Polish Poles realized that you know one has to much but one has to be much better organized in order to regain independence and instead one would take care of uh, trying to educate people, their children in Polish, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and like kind of doing a sort of organic organic uh, work. Okay, thank you. Um, Philip. Yes, thank you for that wonderful lecture. I, I wonder was any official representation of Poland. After 1795, after the partition, there's a famous story that there was still a representative at the port. I wondered if there was any truth in that. So, Philip, your mic was a little bit muted. Could, could you just repeat that? Is this any better? Yes, that's better. I wondered if there was any official representation between 1795 and 1831 in mm -hmm. Istanbul. And is there any truth in the story that there was always a, a summons to a Polish ambassador at the Sublime Port? <laughs> um, so yeah, you're referring to the famous story of the dragoman of uh, Kayetan Aksak, who apparently, so I'll quickly allow myself to recount the story. So, um, so the story goes that uh, even though Poland was partitioned and there was no need for a, for a dragoman anymore, the person who um, who fulfilled that function decided that they would continue with their routine, and because the Ottomans were so empathetic with the Polish with the with the fate of Poland, they would allow him to continue with his routine. So during summer he would be living uh, in the house in Ortaköy. During winters that he would leave uh, on the street that I showed you, where this last legacy on Nurizia Sokal 
uh, was uh, he would where the last legacy was located that he would be that the same honors were paid to him during the whole time until his death as if he was still the representative of the Polish state. Uh, so, so to be honest, we are not sure because we know that the person existed. It it's even in documents. It's uh, even argued that he might have been uh, have been working for for Russia after Poland was partitioned. Uh, but at the same time, we only get the account a few decades later. So on the first account that mentions th this, practi this practice, uh, no, the, the ceremony that he witnessed after the partitions uh, comes from the memoir of Michał Tchaikovsky about whom I talked so much, um, that was compiled by his daughter uh, seven decades later, uh, or other emigres and travelers. So to be honest, uh, it's a bit similar like the story about the deputy of Lehistan, yes, who apparently every time during the meetings of the Divan, it would be asked, is the, is the, uh, is the, is the deputy of Lehistan yet here? And then the one would always respond, not yet, he couldn't come due to the obstacles on the way and which would, call this, uh, would, which would cause this discontent among the representatives of uh, Prussia, Russia and, and Austria. And again, that's, we do not have any proof that this, the ceremony actually take place and that question was asked, yeah? Uh, so that's again, something that was, uh, that, that came, that was a kind of, uh, Use as a story a few decades later. Thank you very much. So it feels like a nice, nice legend um, that we like repeating to each other during all the official meetings between Polish and Turkish representatives. <laughs> I'm going to publish your your research in articles. <laughs> yes, French or English. Yeah. Yes. Um, any other comments or, or questions? Um, I've I've got one about the Cossack um, regiment. Um, my great-grandfather um, was Polish um, and after studying uh, for an engineering degree at the University of St. Petersburg, he rushed to the Ottoman Empire to join the Cossack regiment in order to be able to fight in the Crimean War. Um, and he was with the regiment, I think, until about 1866. I mean, he, he had a, a diversion in 1863 when he went back to Poland for the uprising. Um, but um, I, I don't have any details. Where, where is there any history of the Cossack regiment that one can uh, research? Uh, yes. Um, so I do admit that I'm not I'm not the expert. There are people who did it much better than uh, who know the story much better than me. Uh, <laughs> there are excellent books in Polish, but there's also a scholar in Bulgaria, Alexander Zlatanov, who works in English, uh, who writes in English, and his PhD thesis was precisely dedicated to the Sultanic Cossacks Regiment. Huh. Mm -hmm. So Alexander Zlatanov, he's based at the University of Sofia. Okay. And he's been doing an amazing job uh, with his research thanks to his linguistic skills in, in the Ottoman archives, in Poland, uh, in France and uh, in Bulgaria, etc. etc. So I, I recommend his work for sure. Okay. Uh, maybe afterwards, if you could send me his uh, of course, of name, because uh, mm -hmm. I haven't got the spelling correct. All right, okay. we'll do, we'll do, of course. Um, I mean, on, on that, I mean, the, the Ottoman, uh, the port was clearly very sympathetic to the Polish emigres and having a lot of soldiers around, and was, uh, could it, was it always a happy relationship um, you know, with these groups of soldiers, not always employed in the field? Was, was, were there ever troubles? Uh, yes, uh, we, when one looks at the records, for instance, from, uh, uh, from Adampol, from Polonesco, we can see that there were many troubles. Like the Poles who were based there were like uh, real troublemakers, uh, and they were, had no one to represent them uh, legally in front of the port until Ostrorok, whom I, about whom I spoke uh, for a little bit, was appointed officially as as, as a legal representative of of, of uh, the settlers. But yes, uh, when we look at the memoirs, it 
so there were some Poles who were convinced that Poland can regain independence with the help of Sublime Port, but others were much more down, down earth and uh, understood that sometimes uh, they complained a lot about how things worked in the Ottoman Empire. Um, some of them, that, but they also saw the Ottoman Empire as a, as a kind of way of making an easy career. Uh, I think Bozhensky, Mustafa Jalaldin Pasha in this respect is a great example. So he was trained first, he was supposed to be a, a painter back in Poland, then he went to the, he was supposed to be a priest, then he left the, the monastery or the, 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 the seminar and, uh, and joined the uprising in Greater, in greater Poland. Mm, in 1848 and that's how he got into the Ottoman Empire and in a way once he converted to Islam he was promoted to like one on the, on the ranks of the of the military career it was he got as far as being a general and that's also what we see in other accounts when it's enough that you come from Europe and suddenly you are employed as an engineer as a head of I don't know road construction and Poles do talk about it a lot uh, that it's quite they were perplexed at how easy it is to make their, their careers, but they would also very much complain, not all of them, but some of them in their memoirs on the way how things worked in the, in the Ottoman Empire or in the Middle East more, more generally. Uh, so yeah, and they would say it was sometimes enough to say that you are Polish in order to get, like, to get a job, to get a post. Okay, any, any questions, comments from anybody else? Um, Ian, do you want, you're on mute if you, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Please. It's just an observation, Paulina, but my parents worked in Istanbul. My father was at the consulate for many years in, in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And I came to a boarding school in England in the early 50s and mm -hmm. went back to Istanbul every summer holidays. And part of the holiday was always to have a week at Polonesco, yes. <laughs> which you mentioned in one of your slides. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were all Catholics, we could attend mass at Polonesco. And I may be wrong, I, the only name I remember was a Mrs. Shukov. Whether mm -hmm. that's right or not, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But I do remember having very enjoyable holidays when I was a teenager, way back in the 50s. Wow. And it's still like a very popular destination, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. I haven't been back. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But is it a destination for Turks as well as a curious? Right, right now, very much. Yes. Uh, the, 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 it's a, like I have agrotourism. That's what it's known as. Like people go and stay in the pension. Uh, it's or, or the hotels. There are a, few, a lot of spas. So like all the Poles who live there. And most of them, they own they own hotels and they're busy with uh, hosting tourists. There were no mm, hotels when I were there. It was purely now, we stayed now, with the families. We just stayed now. with the families. Yes. No one uh, right now. Uh, when I was leaving Turkey at, in early 2017, uh, tourism was amazingly amazing developed uh, developed there in in Polonesco. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually invited to give a talk at uh, at something that is called the Cherry Festival. It's something that, that's a tradition there, and there are like uh, music groups and dance groups, come, traditional folk groups coming from Poland to, to, to join. Uh, so uh, now I think after the pandemic, they want to like restart the, the tradition. Uh, and, so, and are there families that still speak Polish? In Poland? Yes. So there are around 70 people, 70 inhabitants do hold Polish passports. And, and yes, one, one can speak Polish to them. It's a... Uh, it's quite interesting. It's a bit archaic, uh, but they do insist on speaking Polish with you. So, uh, and then there was also the moment when there wouldn't be enough brides. So around the 80s, some, some uh, brides were brought from Poland, which also helped in a way because uh, they were teaching their children uh, Polish from Poland. And, uh, and yes, so the, com the community is quite vibrant. They do take, uh, they to do take part in the, elections like presidential elections parliamentary elections in poland they always come to vote to the consulate uh, and they also are aware of how special they are for both sides polish and turkish because whenever there are any visits of um, of high-ranked dignitaries from poland uh, for instance the, when the president comes 
he would always visit Polonesco. It would be like on the, on the bucket list of places that have to be visited by the prime minister or the president of Poland. Okay, I see. Just on the chat, just to Angela Fry also has Polish ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, and she comments her great great grandfather was one of the Polish exiles in France uh, who ended up in Istanbul and married an Italian. What was the Italian family that. Uh, oh, you're, you're mute, Angela. Uh, it was Ionese. They were tailors from Sicily, oh, lovely. which was a fairly recent uh, discovery. Um, it, I, I found that uh, trying to get any trace of my Polish ancestors being really, really difficult and trying to find out exactly where in Poland they came from as well has just proved impossible. But uh, uh, there's just little dribs and drabs come through every now and then. But one of the things that did turn up was his name in um, a memoir by uh, a count who wrote um, an almanac listing all the Polish emigres who'd ended up in France that he'd managed to trace uh, in the 1830s. And his name is in there. So, hmm. nice. Well, fascinating. Where, 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 Paulina, where do you get your um, sort of records of memoirs and testimonials what, what are your sources uh so most of the memoirs and correspondences that i have uh come either from the Czartoryski library in krakow mm -hmm. is the best place for the manuscripts uh a good thing is that many of the memoirs have been published uh so they're available actually as books or right now with the digitalization they're now actually available online as well uh, and and I will never forget my work in the Ottoman archive when I was just writing the suffix ski and was trying to see if there will be any posts uh, popping up. But sometimes the way how the names are spelled, when I knew who I was looking for, the options that I had been trying and the results that I was getting were incredible. Like it was so difficult to find. I don't know, like the person I worked wrote my PhD on, he's called Gastoft. But I would find him in the Ottoman records as Gustav, Gastov, Gostov. So um, mm. it's quite a, it's quite an adventure when you try to locate these people in the Ottoman archive. And obviously the the parishes, the the, the records of baptisms and marriages, etc., uh, in Saint Esprit at Saint Antoine were very useful for sure. Yeah. I mean, what, whether it was that actually a dedicated Polish church uh, outside of uh, Adam Paul. Uh huh. So it was mainly the, um, the 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 one the Georgian Church, the Georgian Catholic Church, because that's where the Poles founded the altar. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it would be Santa Maria, where Poles would go, as well as San uh, San Antoine. And one, it's still up until today, there are masses mm -hmm. in Polish every Saturday, sun, su Sunday, Sunday morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Santa Maria was also quite popular. It was even. There was this, I, I, I showed you a picture in one, on one of the slides when there's this Polish celebration at Mickiewicz's house with the Ottoman and Polish banners. So actually that was like this big day that started with a mass attended by both Christians and Muslims uh, in Santa Maria Draperi that was uh, officiated in Polish with songs being sung, national songs being sung in, sung in Polish and then the procession would go which was attended by hundreds of people, uh, not only Poles, not only the Ottoman Turks, but also Egyptians, Regions, um, uh, Jews, um, uh, Tatars, etc., etc. Uh, and the, the procession walked to the house of the of Adam Mickiewicz, where the family that owned the house slaughtered the lamb. Uh, so there was like a very interesting way how different uh, different customs did converge, etc. etc. So yes, Santa Maria was also an important, an important church for the Polish community, even from before the partitions. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, any other thoughts or comments? I have one, one more question, but I don't want to hog the, the airwaves. Um, but my, my last question, mm -hmm. was there a Polish society to in the same way that um, yeah, we will hear about a Hungarian society from Gabor Fodor in April. Was, was there something like that? There was, there was indeed. Uh, there was the, since 1885, 
function the Society of Mutual Help and Support. Uh, and it, it was part of the of what is called the Association of Polish Emigration, which was like a, a big network of different societies in different parts of the world, from Brazil through the US to Paris, London, etc. So it was part branch of a, of a bigger network. And after the First World War, uh, this society was replaced by something called the Polish House, Dom Polski. And of that society, we have many records uh, that are stored in the, th that we have thanks to the records of the embassy and the consulate, and they're stored in Warsaw. And it was pretty active in the interwar period. So yes, there's always been a society. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, if there isn't, uh, if there aren't any more comments or questions, um, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk, very personal to me as it happens, but I think of, of general interest as well. And thank you also for struggling on despite, you know, your your voice. I hope you recover it. And oh, yes. oh, no, no worries. Oh, I'm, I'm, well, I, I thank you for your patience uh, with it. I really don't like coughing, but uh, nothing to do. I, I ran away from cold, hoping that I would stay stay uh, healthy and that's why I'm here in Israel but uh, I hope it's not Omicron. <laughs> yeah well, well very much hope that, that nothing further develops and, and uh, it clears quickly. Anyway thank you again we really enjoyed it um, and uh, look forward to, to the keeping in touch. Thank you. thank you very much for having me thank you very much for being here with me tonight thank okay. you. Thanks and good night everyone. Good night thank good you night. for your time.